Well, it's very nice to have you tuned in with us this Sunday morning. If you can have Mark chapter 11 open in front of you, we're going to take a look at that now. But before we do that, let's pray. Father, we do ask that as we open your word, please, will you speak to us this morning? Challenge us, we pray, Father. As we open your living word, may its words live in our hearts. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, eBay is the world's largest internet marketplace. And I guess most, if not all of us, have used it from time to time without any problems at all. But that's not the case for everyone. And over the years, it has been a, a haven for scammers. So much so, there's actually websites dedicated to the often hilarious products that have been sold on eBay through deceptive means. This gentleman, for example, thought he was buying a rug for his bedroom. He will, from now on, be reading dimension sizes on the website a little bit more carefully. As will, actually, this grandmother who uh, bought a new school bag for her grandson, which apparently only really fits the cat. But perhaps most tragic of all of the ones that I read on the internet this week is this chap, Paul Barrington. He won an auction for a state-of-the-art MacBook, which to his surprise and to delight, he won for only £300. What a bargain. He was further surprised, though, when a Featherlight package arrived from the seller. Uh, and when he opened it, he discovered he was now the proud new owner of a picture of a MacBook. Apparently there was something about that in the small print on the advert. You know, it's a horrible feeling to know that you have been badly misled by false advertising. And that is precisely what we see in the Bible passage that we read just earlier. It's all about things that promise much, that advertise something really good, but fail miserably to deliver. Now, all the commentaries on Mark like to talk about how the author will often structure his storytelling in what they call sandwiches. And here we have this morning a very obvious Mark sandwich. Mark does this because along with other gospel writers, he's not just telling a story for a story's sake. The gospel accounts in the Bible are not just simple biographies, you see. Rather, the authors are recounting these events for the purpose of teaching a specific point. <clears throat> and we know that the specific point of a sandwich is its filling. The bread of this particular sandwich is two slices of fig tree and the filling is the temple in Jerusalem. Let's call it a fig tree sandwich with turbulent temple filling. We're going to walk through it this morning and we're going to take a closer look at each layer to see what it teaches us. But we already know then, of course, up front, that the big point has got something to do with the filling, with the temple. So we'll divide up into three sections this morning, the cursing, the clearing and the conclusion. Mark sets the scene for us in verse 11 here. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not yet the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say it. Bertrand Russell, maybe you've heard the name before, a British philosopher who died in the 1970s, was known for his anti-Christian views. In his book, beautifully titled, Why I Am Not a Christian, Russell accuses Jesus of vindictive fury for such a harsh treatment of a poor fig tree. Seems a bit over the top to me. It's just a fig tree, people. 
But he's not alone in finding this fig tree incident offensive. One particular Bible scholar wrote about this episode we just read and said this. It is a tale of miraculous power wasted in the service of ill temper. For the supernatural energy employed to blast the unfortunate tree might have been more, more usefully expended in forcing a crop of figs out of season. As it stands, it is simply incredible. <laughs> well, both of these offended men, interestingly enough, are British. And you know what we're like about our gardens. I personally find it incredible that they seem to imbue this wretched fig tree with personality and talk about it like it's some kind of child or something. It's a fig tree, people. But if Jesus had no other reason to curse the thing other than his disappointed frustration, they might have some kind of tenuous point in their commentaries, mightn't they? If Jesus had no other reason for cursing the fig tree. But I think Mark makes it plain that he does. The fig tree is to become an important living parable for us, an object lesson for the disciples and also for us, warning us about the dangers of keeping up appearances. Look a little bit more closely with me. In verse 12, we find that Jesus is hungry. And so he looks around for something that might curb his appetite. And in verse 13, there in the distance, we see he sees a fig tree. So Jesus goes over to investigate. Now, Mark tells us that it was not fig season. And we can assume that Jesus knows this. But apparently any local would know that this doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing to eat on a fig tree. Just after harvest, a fig tree sprouts buds which swell and remain on the tree throughout winter, waiting for spring to arrive so they can really grow. And these edible buds are called pagim. They're usually edible just before the first leaves appear on the tree. So when Jesus sees a tree with leaves, he would be right to assume there ought to be something to eat on the tree. But there isn't. The leaves are just false advertising. Here is a tree with signs of fruit. You'd expect there to be fruit, but it is barren. And in the hearing of his disciples, we read, Jesus speaks to the tree and he curses the tree. But this is about more than just disappointment over a few fig buds. Mark moves us straight on into the city after this incident and up to the temple. Take a look with me at verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. Now, the temple was an enormous place in Jerusalem. And at this point, Jesus is almost certainly in the court of the Gentiles, the first court of the temple. It was the largest of the four temple courts. And it was an open air quadrangle, apparently with an area of about 35 acres. So this was a big place and it was surrounded, according to the historian Josephus, by a portico with with columns 30 feet high and apparently so massive that it took three people holding their hands together to, to go around just one base of one of these columns. It was an imposing place. And also, add to the details here, this is the week running up to Passover. And so every Jew in the empire is going to have made an effort to get to the city uh, and something in the region of a quarter of a million lambs are going to be sacrificed for this festival. That makes you think, doesn't it? This was a busy place of worship. 
but more so, it was a busy place of commerce. And when he sees what is going on, Jesus hits the roof. Well, what's the big deal? What is it that triggers Jesus? Well, let's assume that you're a humble peasant who's come to the temple to worship God. And you need to get an offering to sacrifice, but you're, you're quite poor, so you approach the dove sellers. It's the cheapest thing going, and you're looking for a bargain. But they don't want your stinking money. Why? Because it's Roman, and it's got an image on it, breaking the second commandment. And it's probably also, to add insult to injury, it's made from mixed metals, alloys. You can't, sp you can't spend that there. They're not having it. And so it's back off to the money changers. And they're the ones who take the first big cut, giving you an extortionate exchange rate. Then you return to the dove sellers who will gladly sell you a marked up priced bird. After all, it has to be temple approved quality as well, doesn't it? Now, I don't know about you, but roadside services really annoy me here in the UK. I now travel actually with a kettle and a coffee maker in my car. People take the mickey, but this saves me about £20 when our family stops for refreshments. I made an inquiry once a few years back uh, to McDonald's about the reasons for these high prices, prices that are so much higher than than the franchises that they have on the high street. And the answer they gave me is, oh, mate, it's overheads, it's overheads. Because apparently in the middle of nowhere, by the side of the M1, you have a more desirable location than Oxford Street, if the prices are anything to go by. Well, the reality is you're actually a captive client. You're a captive customer. They can charge whatever they like because you don't have any alternative options, do you? Unless you're me, with my kettle and with my special espresso jug that plugs in, in my car. Who's laughing now? Well, the same basic situation existed in the temple in Jerusalem. The 20th century theologian, uh, William Barclay, estimated that the equivalent costs would be to say that, well, if a dove costs three and a half P outside the temple, it would have cost 75p inside. I don't know if he's right, but if he's right, that is one amazing markup in prices, isn't it? Now, the authorities saw this as an opportunity, pure and simple, to make money. And this is what made Jesus's blood boil. Here is an almost perfect example for us of righteous anger. As Jesus comes along and he flips the tables and he blocks the porters from moving the merchandise around the courts of the temple. And you can imagine that the people took notice. And so we see that Jesus is soon teaching the gathering crowds who've come to take a look. Look at verse 17 with me. Jesus says to them, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you've made it a den of robbers. From your very first entrance into this temple complex, obstacle after obstacle was put before the worshipper to hinder their access to God. In fact, this whole system created by the religious authorities in Jerusalem existed to make it, maybe not intentionally, but to make it hard to worship God. And Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah at them. Not only do they make things prohibitively expensive, but where did this idea of separating all the courts out come from anyway? Originally, the tabernacle, if you've read through the Old Testament part of the Bible, the tabernacle was designed with, well, basically with a holy place only for the priests and then a big courtyard around it for worshippers, worshippers of all types, as long as they were ritually pure. Now there's an inner court for pure Jewish men. Then a bit further out, you've got one for women. Uh, and then lastly, you've got an outermost court where Jesus is now, a court for the Gentiles. 
not possibly of the higher calibre required to go any further in. The road was paved, do you see, for the wealthy, upstanding Jewish male. But everyone else had to struggle along through the temple if they wanted to meet with God. They had obstacle after obstacle in their way. And God spoke through Isaiah, expressing his desire explicitly there, that all nations might come to him at his house. But instead, the temple industry just viewed the nations as a means to get rich quick. They weren't there to serve them. They were just there to make money out of them. And Jesus calls it a den of robbers. A den of robbers. Read with me from verse 18. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. Well, the reaction of the chief priests betrays the fact that they've been rumbled. Jesus has exposed their true hearts to the crowds and he's left them actually speechless. They've got no comeback here. It's devastating what Jesus says. And of course, they want him dead. See, Jesus came to the fig tree, showing all signs that it should have fruit, and he found nothing on it. Only barrenness, only false advertising. Jesus comes to the temple, a hive of religious activity, the buzz of life, and finds the same. They advertise, come here, access for God, access to God. And they've got showing signs of, of religious purity and piety. But they are wicked thieves at heart. There's no fruit here either. Just show. You know, a number of years ago, Sarah and I took a holiday to Rome. It was a wonderful week. We spent the week exploring the city, a city that was once the hub of Western Christianity. Well, we took the inevitable trip to the Vatican and the tour of the Vatican ended in St. Peter's Basilica. Grand building, the largest church building in the world, regarded as the holiest of all Roman Catholic shrines. Across the centre of the church, I noticed there was a very long queue forming. And it was formed of people waiting their turn at a great statue of St. Peter. Well, I was intrigued. And so I wandered up. I wondered, you know, why is everyone queuing here? I walked to the front of the queue to discover that each person was waiting their turn to rub St. Peter's toe. Now, I wonder how Peter would have felt about that. He probably said, oh, get off my toe. But do you see... Here was all the trappings of religion, but utterly fruitless, dead. Surely, surely, I thought to myself, any minister worth his salt would be having an absolute fit here seeing this. I mean, do something, fence it off, or better yet, destroy the thing if it's causing that kind of a stumbling block to people. This is how Jesus feels about empty religion. Religion that puts obstacles between him and those who are trying to come to him. Mark continues in verse 30. Sorry, verse 20. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Well, in these verses, we get the complete of the sandwich. That which should have been a muster station, drawing the, nat the nations to God, has actually become a hindrance. And it is cursed, just like this fig tree, the parable. The temple is basically a great big false advertising campaign. There will be no harvest from this temple. It will pass away because it is not fit for purpose. And the fig tree makes this clear. 
The clearing of the temple is not Jesus instigating reformation, cleaning and restoring the institution to its fruitful use again. No, no, no. It is cursing it and consigning it to oblivion, which happens only a few decades later. And that is something that will become clearer and clearer as we read on through the next couple of chapters of Mark. But the withered fig tree also becomes another object lesson for the disciples in these last closing verses. They are taken aback, you see, by the speed at which Jesus' curse has been enacted. The tree is, as literally we're told, withered from the roots upwards over the course of one day. Now, this is, of course, no big deal for the creator of the cosmos to achieve. It is not a waste of miraculous power, as that writer said, that could have been put to better use. As if God had only limited reserves to use. And Jesus uses this opportunity to teach another lesson, a lesson about faith. Take a look with me at verse 22. Have Faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Jesus here teaches about the power of believing prayer. When we bring our requests to God, we should do so with such great faith that we believe we've already received it. That is, we ask for things as if they are as good as done when we come to God, because we know that's what God is like. When we pray, we remember that the one that we pray to can do anything. He's the creator. And, and of course, we must not fall into the error of the popular false teachers that you can see on the TV. Who understand this kind of passage as speaking things into existence by some kind of mystical faith force. That is a concept that is completely foreign to the Bible. Bible teacher Don Carson remarks, saying this, Belief in the New Testament is never reduced to forcing oneself to believe what he does not really believe. Instead, it is related to genuine trust in God and obedience to the discernment of his will. Though exercised by the believer, such faith reposes on the will of God who acts. We saw this when we went through the book of James together last year. The prayer of faith is that which is completely in tune with what God wants. At that point, when we pray that kind of prayer, all that hinders us from having is that we don't ask, says James. The point is that we ought not to be amazed that God is able to throw a mountain into the sea. He's God. Of course he can. But knowing this ought to drive us to prayer with faith. Additionally, I would suggest there's another connection here, one that ties this to the fig tree sandwich that precedes it. And that is that the temple is now about to become obsolete. And why is that? Because if you have Jesus, you no longer need the temple. What do his disciples need to do if they want to approach God? They don't need to travel to Jerusalem for the meeting place between God and man stands among them. With Jesus, all obstacles are removed. Indeed, the only obstacle between God and his disciples' people is doubt. It is simply by faith that we approach and draw near into an intimate relationship with our creator. Jesus concludes in verse 25, look. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your father in heaven may forgive your sins. You see, the only condition to being truly and completely forgiven is not to put your trust in one of those quarter of a million Passover lambs, 
but to put your trust in Jesus. And if you can grasp by faith, in fact, the evidence that you have grasped by faith, the staggering magnitude of the de debt that you've been forgiven, you can forgive others too. So let me ask in closing, what or better who are you trusting? You had better make sure that that which you are pinning your hopes on, hopes for eternity, can deliver. Beware of trusting that which is empty and fruitless and barren. Beware of trusting empty ritual and religion. Just because something looks alive and promises substance doesn't mean it can deliver the goods. There is only one source of salvation and life. It is not a building or a religious ceremony. There's no salvation to be found in a life lived morally and well. There is no salvation to be found in heroic pilgrimages or acts of religiosity. There is only one who can save. Only one who can give eternal life. And that is Jesus. As the apostles first preached, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Well, let's pray as we close. Father, we ask that you would help us not to be enticed by those things that promise much and yet deliver only emptiness. Instead, we pray that you would help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, to add nothing to him but simply trust him alone. We do not need to bring sacrifices and offerings to win your favour, Father. Instead, we thank you for our glorious Saviour, who saves to the uttermost those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. We thank you for your precious Son, Jesus, our Saviour, in whose good name we pray. Amen.